of the Type 38 Arasaka, which is the main battle rifle at the time of 1939. I'm gonna shooting these fucking things at me. This should be fun. Not bad. 
so quiet that it And again, we want to explain everything. We want you to go around and ask questions. Paulus, report, please. Myself and my driver here are portraying motorized troops of the Polish Army in 1939. Despite what many, many may tell you, the Polish Army did have a sizable motorized contingent consisting of tankettes, light tanks, mo mo motorcycles, as well as small civilian cars for staff duty and other, and other such things such as ammunition carrying, reconnaissance, you name it, they used it. We're both dismounted right now. As the war went on in Poland, the supply, supply lines were cut by the Germans, and so we ran out of gasoline. What, whatever you got, you usually siphoned out of civilian cars left on the side of the road by their owners. If you lost spare parts, too bad. You get off, you walk, or you load yourself into a truck if you can. I'm portraying an officer, hence why I'm wearing my breeches, riding boots, and all of these accoutrements that are more made for dress. Polish officers did like their flair. They usually also wore leather jackets. Unfortunately, it's too hot for me to wear that right now. My driver here, who would have been driving a, driving a motorcycle, uh, since I as the officer, I would have commanded either from my tankette or during traveling marches in the sidecar of a motorcycle with him driving. He's using a Gewehr 98, 8mm Mauser rifle of World War I vintage. All Polish rifles and machine guns were, tr were chambered in 8mm Mauser. His uniform is designed specifically for Ride, for riding a motorcycle and working around oil and other things that can either burn you, you can fall off the motorcycle, you can hurt yourself, so on and so forth. And now he'll give you a demonstration of the 8mm Mauser. That's right, that's right. They're going to shoot me. They're going to shoot this at me, too. Fire in the hole! Fire! <laughs> Cannon's rifle is chambered in 8mm Mauser. He has a 48. Bayonet? At the beginning of the war, actually before France and Germany got involved, Stalin and Hitler were partners. They decided to carve up Eastern Europe. Stalin was able to take back over Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia and decided, well, part of the agreement was they got Finland too. So right, right around the time when uh, Poland was invaded, Right after Poland was invaded, yep, right after. the Soviet Union, a country of 180, invaded a country of 4 million. And so this is a Finnish impression from the continuation. Finland had two wars. So my impression that I'm displaying today is basically going to be what the average Finnish soldier would look like in that 1943 to 1944. Um, basically, short like Don had just mentioned, Finland basically had two different wars during the period of 1939 to 1945. Actually, three wars. Um, they, consider, they were considered a minor axis power, but they do not consider themselves a minor, minor axis power. They consider themselves a the total belligerent of the axis forces. Um, they fought in three different wars at that time. Uh, go into that at the, the next one, the Tour of Eastern Front. Yep. The yeah, I was just going to go over it, yeah. So basically, uniform, their uniform was basically derived a lot of the German and Austro-Hungarian stuff in World War I. They copy pasted it. Um, their rifle, uh, they had a variation of the Mosin Nagant rifle. They would use standard 9130s, so they would have a couple different variations. I'll just play a shot. in front. I'm going to walk whatever spectators are interested through each nationality and you get a little bit more in depth. It'll take an hour. But uh, then after that, questions and answers. And uh, representing Germany? Hello, I'm Klaus Wolfgang. I'm Fieldbabel in the German regular army. Fieldbabel is equivalent to sergeant. So I'm a squad leader. We usually have maybe 12 men, squad machine gun and such. You can see this is the probably early or mid uniform. Germany starts off looking very fashionable, but a green collar, you know, tall marching boots, shiny helmet with national symbols on the side of it. 
As the war progresses, they find this to be very impractical. They are told to scratch this insignia off the helmet. They start to put things on it to make it more camouflaged. Germany has trouble with supplies often. The wool itself starts to become more substitute. So this is good early war uniform. The later war uniform looks more brown. The early war one is more of a greenish blue. The insignia is made darker and such. Uh, they run out of leather, so they start issuing low boots. So there's German soldiers with no stiefel. That is the replacement boots. Guys, try to be mindful. We know you're speaking, but as soon as the uh, air approaches that side, it's almost impossible to hear. I lost most of my hearing. A mortar went over my head and uh, saw it on Moscow. Tore my face up good and wrecked my hearing, so that's why <laughs> I'm not hearing the plane. Uh, this is basic infantry man's kit. You can see bread bag, food goes in here. This is, this is canteen, water goes in there. This can on my back holds the gas mask. Adolf Hitler was uh, injured by gas in the First World War, so he was very strict on making sure that the soldiers carried the gas mask and can at all times. The equipment on the front was to feed the MP40. Rifleman carries in the black pouches and the K98 for standard arm. This is MP40. This was standard German submachine gun. So a lot of times squad leaders and vehicle operators carry this weapon. Uh, that's pretty much the basics of what I've got on. You know, the NCO, I've got map case. Uh, is that good enough? Uh, yeah, the, either you want to fire the MP40s? Do you have any uh, rounds with you? I do, you want me to fire? Yeah. Ammunition is tight, so I'm not going to do much shooting. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Firing the hole! Yeah, baby. <laughs> oh, it's on safe. <laughs> All right. Now, that was German Army, and now SS. Represent the SS. We represent the SS, which is the private political organization founded by Heinrich Himmler after the SA. Early in the war, Himmler planned to take over as the new Reich leader. How he did this was he eliminated no, Rome. No, no, no politics right now. Save that. But uniform and weapon. Uh, so uniform of uh, the SS was a bit different from the here, as they wore camouflage uniforms. They were. Uh, uniform is very similar to the tunic, however, they came in a camouflage pattern. Me, I, I'm wearing a smock and a uh, camouflage cap, uh, much more baggier and a slightly different pattern, and these patterns were unique to the SS. Our weapons are the K-98K uh, standard issue rifle of the German Army, World War II. Bolt action. Keep going on, I just didn't need to fire. All right. Uh, so our uniform, so again, the camo is a big part of our impression, uh, so. The one thing that I wanted to point out that I didn't cover, uh, he would be a foreign volunteer in, in the SS. The SS, while it was a political arm, they wouldn't let foreign volunteers necessarily serve, under most cases, in the German army. But they were recruited as a group. This is a Swedish volunteer. The Swedish volunteer was the smallest number of all the Scandinavian countries, so like 600? Uh, about 200. About 200 in the SS. That's a really small number. But the SS was probably the largest foreign legion in the world ever. <laughs> about one third of the SS were foreign. All right? And Spain. Um, Spain was actually the only foreign uh, volunteers that the uh, country actually did, did not declare war against the, uh, the Allies. Spain actually remained neutral. However, about 45,000 men from Spain actually served on a Spanish-made German division. And the reason for that is because a lot of them believe that uh, Russia was the cause of the uh, Spanish Civil War. Um, when Germany, Germany helped the uh, nationalist side in Spain, the ones that actually installed Francisco Franco as the uh, president of Spain. So when, Spain de when Germany declared war on Russia, Spain actually, uh, many Spanish actually were hoping Spain would actually join Germany. However, Franco knew better, he didn't join, because Spain couldn't really afford another war. However, he allowed 
a division to fight for the Germans. The division was acting between 1941 and 1943. 1943 got disbanded after the Battle of Krasny War. However, many Spaniards actually continued to fight until basically the end of the war. Uh, the last Spaniards to fight in World War II were actually in Berlin. Uh, well, just a little bit about the uniform. Um, the volunteers, actually, you're going to see the rest of the actual countries that declare officially war. They were allowed to leave their country to the front in their national uniforms. The Spaniards couldn't do that because they were neutral, so that will be against the, uh, the war rules. So what they did is they actually wore their Civil War uniforms. I'm wearing this blue shirt right here which was very common from the nationalist side. Um, then once they got to Germany, the Germans will issue them a standard German army equipment. That included uniforms, shirts, everything. Uh, when the volunteer will be repatriated back to Spain, they will go through Germany, they will actually give the German uniform back, and then they will issue them back the, the clothes that they actually wore to go back home. So hence the reason now, the, a little thing about the blue shirt is that they kept these shirts because when they got to Germany, most Spaniards were little guys. So when they got issued the German shirts, they were just simply too big. So they were like, no, we're not wearing this. So they just kept their shirts. Now, also, you see the blue shirt. It worked over the collar yes. so you could see the blue shirt. That was, yeah, that was to keep the identity. They just didn't want to be, they don't want to see them look like Germans. They want to be Spaniards. And the nickname of the division is the uh, Division Azul, or Blue Division. That's what the Germans gave them. Originally, it was the 250th Infantry Division within the German uh, military structure. But the Germans nicknamed him the Blue Division because of this particular. Um, and reason mainly was because the Spaniards never really stuck to uh, German uniform code. That this is not really allowed by German soldiers, and that usually annoyed the Germans, so hence why. They, they did it anyway. Yeah, they did it anyway. Yeah. Hungry. I'm representing Royal Hungary in World War II, 1941 to about 1945. Uh, Hungary was economically devastated after the First World War, so they had to reuse a lot of the old uniforms. So a lot of the leather gear, a lot of the shovels, all that stuff is all used from the First World War. The actual uniform itself is very much based on that as well. All they really did was change the color. They scalloped the pockets a little bit. The hat, a cute little bush guy, Shopka. It has a neat little brim that does absolutely nothing because it's very short. It also pulls down if I unbutton it so I can keep myself warm in the wind. When I'm on the attack, I do have a doll helm here. This is a Hungarian one. It looks a lot like the German one. You got it. Yeah, I know. Uh, there's a style helm on my back. It's not. I'm not wearing it now. It's a little heavy, but it is a Hungarian one. It's domestically produced there. Very similar to that one. It was also very common to see World War One ones as well. I have a Hungarian FEG 35M, which is a domestically produced rifle, 8 by 56. I suppose I can do a demonstration, it's not very different, but I'm not going to do a demonstration, it's too hard to get out of the place. <laughs> <laughs> and Italy. Buongiorno a tutti. I am a, uh, portraying a Royal Carabinieri, which is the Italian National Military Police. As you can imagine an FB, or sorry, you can imagine an Army MP giving the authority of the FBI who drives around like a state trooper. That's pretty much what we are. First thing you'll notice is this big giant hat on my head. This is called the Lucerna. Like, uh, instead of wearing an MP for Sard on my shoulder, I'm wearing this to signify that I'm on duty performing security or anti-partisan duties. Very similar to uh, German military police who are not here, who has a uh, thing around their neck, metal thing. All right, uh, my rank is Apuntanto, which is uh, sort of like a corporal or a uh, specialist. That means I have enough responsibility and I'm trusted not to hurt myself, but they're not going to give me any troops in. Right, my main sidearm that I have is a Beretta 1934 handgun, very small weapon. It's the uh, 380. I'm not going to demonstrate that right now. Standard sh shoulder weapon for them was the model 1891 Carcano Carbine. 
See one person. This was not the only submachine gun that the Italians made that actually really worked. <laughs> Sadly not. They actually uh, they used this as a squad automatic weapon due to the fact that the belt fed weapon they had at the time, the Breda, was a piece of crap and was jamming every minute. So instead, a guy on that squad would be carrying what they would call a samurai vest, which is full of magazines, festoons, and looks exactly like the samurai vest. The interesting thing about this weapon, you'll see it has two triggers. One is for semi-automatic fire, and one is for full automatic fire. Since this has been a blank conversion, this may or may not work, so please bear with me. Weapon is still. All right, name's Michael. My grandmother used to call me Mikhailo. I, I, what I have here is the Ukrainian insurgent army. This uniform was part of the Galician division. Many of the guys after the Battle of Brody infected, jumped out and joined the insurgent army. Initially welcoming the Germans, they soon wanted to gain their own independence, and they wanted to gain independence from Germany, Russia, and Poland. Okay. I have a mix of kit here. It's Soviet, it's German, and I also have some traditional Ukrainian. Mazapinka. PPS-43, Soviet. M-24, stick grenade. F-1, Russian. What I have here would be elements of all uniforms, all kit, anything that I can get a hold of, so I can do my job. Uh, and, uh, up. I wear the uniform of what was called the Russian Liberation Army, which was never an army. If you want to know more about that, come to the uh, tour of the Eastern Front. But well, basically, there were a little over a million Soviet citizens that fought against the Stalin regime, they would have started like this, either in civilian clothes or in Soviet military clothes with all the insignia stripped off and simply wearing an armband that says, in service of the German armed forces. Later on, after a probationary period, they would have been given mostly German uniforms, usually with secondhand garbage. And, um, they were not allowed at first to get German awards, but the frozen meat ribbon would let you know that this guy served in the winter of 41 42. The, the sleeve patch, just like the Ukrainian patch or the Spanish patch, it would indicate Russian Liberation Army, Soviet style boards, Cossack patch on the collar. And uh, somebody asked about my death's head earlier. Uh, this, is, this is not an SS death head. This is the kinder, gentler SS. This is the kinder, gentler death head. This is a panzer death head, which uh, almost all cavalry forces in the world had adopted a death set at some point. So we're almost exactly on a half hour. I want to thank you for your attention. There's a tour of the fort going on. We're going to do a tour of the Eastern Front. Uh, follow the, uh, the whiteboard, and that will be forming here right here at the corner of the building, all right, at one o'clock, all right? One o'clock, exactly, be here, and uh, hope to see you. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Don. Woo!
That was fun.